Welcome to Startup Grind Chicago. My name is Tom Dennison, and I am the uh, original founder, if you will, of Startup Grind Chicago. Welcome everyone here tonight on this uh, very snowy, wintry February evening. And man, do we have a good one for you tonight. But uh, before we get started, just a little bit of background on Startup Grind. Um, by the way, anybody who's been here before in the chat, just let us know. Yeah, I've been a Startup Grind before, uh, but here we are and welcome again. Uh, Startup Grind was actually founded now about almost exactly uh, 12 years ago in Palo Alto and actually started out pretty casually with just uh, some early stage founders getting together and sharing their stories uh, with each other. But one day, our fantastic founder, Derek Anderson, uh, decided, you know what? What if I bring in a more prominent uh, local founder and feature them in a fireside chat? And it was at that moment that Startup Grind, as we know it today, uh, was born. And uh, fast forward just a couple of years, um, and uh, I reached out to Derek and said, hey, I want to do this in Chicago. And he said, sure, go for it. And so since then, uh, this is now our 104th event, if you can believe that. Uh, we were the 12th chapter, but uh, fast forwarding to today, we now are in over 600 cities around the world. And uh, this year will also be our 10th global conference in Redwood City a couple of years ago when it was live and in person. Uh, we had just over 10,000 attendees and a couple hundred incredible uh, speakers like we've got here tonight. And we had some 300 plus startups uh, that were exhibiting there. So hopefully we will recreate that uh, pandemic notwithstanding. Um, this April. So, uh, and, and by the way, if you're interested in coming out to uh, uh, the global conference in Redwood City, you can check it out. Just go to startupgrind.com and you'll see it right away. And please, we'd love to see you out there in uh, beautiful Redwood City. Um, but why do we do this? Why do we bring everybody together? Why do we have an incredible guest like we have here tonight? Well, it's really about three things. Uh, first of all, inspiration and education. And certainly our guest here tonight will inspire and educate. Uh, but the third piece, connection, is really up to all of you. So what I would ask, I know we're in a virtual world here tonight, uh, what I would ask is if possible, please reach out to somebody else that is here tonight with us. Connect with them outside of these four virtual walls that we are all in. If you do that with just one other person here tonight, I promise you only great things will follow. All right, so uh, we have a bit of a tradition here. And again, I know we are all virtual. But uh, I'm going to ask everybody to unmute themselves just for a brief moment. 
And when I announce our wonderful guest, I need everybody to scream and shout as loud as they possibly can, as if, I don't know, the Cubs won the World Series or the Bear, well, maybe not the Bears, but anyway, the Cubs won the World Series. All right, are we ready? Let's give it up for Biju Kulataco. All right. Here we are, Biju. Thanks for joining us here tonight. Now, before we get started here, um, and I'm not sure if I mentioned this to you before, but you know, I know everybody's going to be very eager and anxious to hear about Halo and what you're up to these days. But before all of that, let's go back. Let's go way back. So tell us, uh, tell us about where you're from, where you grew up, and, uh, and maybe the kinds of things that you were thinking and doing as a kid, and if there was at any moment in your childhood where we could see this sort of uh, the birth of an entrepreneur. Well, Tom, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, having me. And, uh, and great to be here. Great to be great to be out of Chicago and uh, very excited to be part of something um, like an anything that's part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So just a little bit about me. I grew up, um, I was born in Bangalore, India. Hmm. Um, so grew up in, in Bangalore and Dubai. So two places that when I grew up there, um, were very, uh, were, were still smaller cities. You know, this was before Dubai became very famous and, and Bangalore became very famous. You know, Bangalore is now like the Silicon Valley of India, but sure. And when I, when I grew up there, it was a, a much smaller town and didn't have the traffic it does. It has okay. now and, and the development it has now. So it was, it was, it was actually great to, um, great to be in both those cities and see, uh, but those cities, even as, even way back, they still had this very entrepreneurial, um, you know, mindset, uh, both in Dubai, uh, before all the, you know, none of the, none of the big buildings you see in Dubai were there when I was growing up and none of the big companies, almost every fortune 500 company isn't, it has an office in Bangalore. And, but that was not the case when I was growing up. And, uh, but you could still see very much the entrepreneurial mindset. And, you know, and I think for me, growing up there, I was just, I didn't really think that I would be an entrepreneur. I was just a tinkerer. So I would just like tinkering with different things. And, and I, I can't say I, I really understood and knew a lot about business, but I really liked um, you know, building different things or, you know, um, uh, building little, you know, models or building little machines or, or, uh, doing a lot of programming. I, I was a self-taught programmer, um, you know, had, had, um, access to some sort of, um, computer or something from, from when I was 12. So I would, you know, I, wow. I started experimenting with, with a lot of different computers, uh, I am what um, what maybe Bill Gates would call like a bedroom programmer. You know, I would basically, <laughs> that's sort of how I taught myself programming. <laughs> you know, with those little, uh, those were called Commodores or Sinclairs oh, yeah. way back oh, in yeah. the day. And but, so I started playing with all these things. I didn't necessarily think I'd be an entrepreneur. I just knew I wanted to build different things. That's really the most I thought about it. And and I, I think that I think that's really what the entrepreneurial spirit is like. You, you, you. Uh, I don't think the entrepreneurial spirit is as much about um, necessarily uh, business or money. It's it's really more about you know you want to create something that you see the world is missing. Um, even you know, be it something small like like a model train, or be it something big like a big company, right? And and you solve your your you're creating something you solve something and that's I think that's the genesis of um, the entrepreneurial spirit at least that's that's my view of it. So, you know, something that I think is very very interesting and I mentioned early on that we you know this is our hundred and fourth uh, startup grind and I can tell you 
that um, over half of the folks that we've had at about, and I'm not kidding, about the age of 12 taught themselves how to program. So if there if there's some sort of you know common thread, uh, that very well could be it. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. And and you know who knows? Maybe it's just a curiosity or what have you. But did that did that kind of curiosity or, or tinkering? What did that lead to? What you focused on at school at at in college? Or uh, kind of walk us through that transition from you know tinkering teaching yourself how to program and entering uh, university life. Yeah, so, you know, when I was thinking of university, I didn't think about, I didn't think about university being something that I needed to, to work on. And, you know, again, was, I mean, me, me, it was not necessarily something directly linked to a career. It was just something I was intellectually curious about. So I did a degree in aerospace engineering. Wow. Uh, I, I like to program. I never really took classes in, in, in programming, but you know, the, the programming came out of tinkering, building different things came out of tinkering, but I always liked reading books about planes and spacecraft and things like that. So I said, okay, you know what, this is, this is really interesting to, uh, uh, you know, would be interesting to study. So, you know, I, 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 I did a degree in that, but I, but in my last year of school, I, um, I saw an ad for a finance company looking for huh. someone to build. It was, and Chicago is basically the epicenter of uh, um, a lot of the um, uh, derivatives companies like, you know, options trading, few options, sure. futures, derivatives. Yeah. So I saw an options market making company basically saying, hey, we need someone to be, help build math models to, 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 to trade what we're doing. And, and I applied for the job and I got it, you know, huh. just given the engineering background, I didn't know a lot about finance, but again, you know, that was, you know, I learned that from, from, from building those models. And so that's how I uh, sort of got into finance. So it's just sort of like one thing leads to another. And that's, <laughs> you I know, think that's thing, what makes it so interesting. One thing I forgot to ask. So how did you and your family end up in Chicago? So I just came, I came here alone for school. Oh, you did? Um, okay. Like, like a lot of other immigrants came here for, for uh, for uh, college and ended up staying here. Got it. Very good. So you get this <laughs> you get this gig out of college in finance, but had no experience in finance, um, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, where where did that where did you go from there? Like, tell us a little bit about your experience there and what that led to. Yeah. So the 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 finance um, led to sort of building, and that was. You know, and, and I think I think um, maybe one of the biggest, you know, things, one of the biggest um, um, variables for success in life sometimes is timing. You know, hmm. so so uh, you know, I was working in finance, and I was I was uh, I understood technology really well. I understood finance and technology really well, and that combination of the two was very useful when all of these markets and if you remember the the famous pictures of the chicago derivatives markets where people were wearing these you know multicolored jackets and standing on floors sure. and flashing signals and then yeah. that whole process was going it was going it was going through a, a, a transition phase to something right. much more electronic right and the best time to be in an industry is when it's going through a transition phase mm -hmm. and and um and also you know just as a result of luck and timing, my skills were well suited for that transition. So I, I uh, uh, just because, you know, the, the business went from, you know, uh, uh, jocks on trading floors to, to uh, basically guys who are good at playing video games upstairs <laughs> uh, off the trading floor, right? And, and I, was, I was the guy who was good at playing video games uh, off the trading floor. So, uh, so, uh, so I, I worked in, I worked in finance for a year. I mean, worked for that firm for a year or two, and then started my own company building, uh, building, uh, algos and trading models for different financial companies. Um, so that was, that was sort of my first, uh, first startup. Um, and then, and then because of my interest in, 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 uh, in software and also, 
building, you know, things, uh, I was always very interested in robotics, right? Robotics was a good combination um, of, of hardware and software um, and from a mechanical and, you know, from a mechanical um, and uh, 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 from, from a mechanical, mechanical angle and from, a, from that sort of software angle. And, uh, and, and so that interest in robotics uh, got me interested in creating um, with, with a couple of co-founders creating Redbox because basically Redbox, you know, I was one of the co-founders of that. It was, it was an idea that came about not because I like movies, but I didn't know a thing about the movie industry, but knew a lot about robotics. And that got me interested in the, on the red box side of things. That's how I approached that. And, and, you know, that deal, that did well for us. And we ended up selling that to a public company. So. Yeah, I'd say that's sort of an understatement, but uh, um, one thing I, I just have to share this, you mentioned timing and I think the gentleman's name, I, I think it's Bill Gross. I think he's the founder of idea labs and he had, you know, he's been involved in, well over a hundred startups. And he did a little bit of research on, you know, what were the common threads for success and I guess for failure as well. And for success, you know, immediately we all assume team and, and what have you, and capital and whatever else, but actually the number one factor was timing. So I find that interesting and, and sort of keeping that in mind when you guys, came up with Redbox, uh, but tell us a little bit more because I do know a little bit of the backstory and how it got started and, and sort of a relationship, I think with McDonald's, if I'm correct. Um, tell us a little bit about that relationship and how timing kind of fit into, uh, I guess, the eventual success of Redbox. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and, you know, timing is not the only thing, right? Timing is one of many, right. many variables, uh, but, uh, but, but timing has a very uh, interesting part in that is that, so me, me and uh, my partners at a company called Get A Movie, uh, hmm. that, that was the name of the, the company. It was very obvious what it did because it was called Get A Movie, <laughs> right? So, uh, and, uh, and then we found, you know, to, to, to roll out a business like that, you know, you need, when you need a lot of capital, but you also need locations, you know, and yeah. McDonald's being in Chicago was uh, our first partner. They had the brand Redbox. Uh, Redbox was basically um, a retail automation experiment that they tried. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and and why that was interesting is, you know, McDonald's is one of the largest owners of retail real estate in the world. Right. And they had looked to, uh, to utilize that 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 real estate in um, you know in ways that were uh, that could generate monetize you know additional revenue for them, and uh, they tried a few different concepts. And long story short, they 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 decided okay, movies was something that could work, uh, and and then we had sort of the technology, and we were trying to do something on our own in the in the same in the same way, and so we sort of put the two together and mm -hmm. Redbox at that point was just a project within McDonald's. It was not a separate company. Mm. We spun it out as a separate company with, 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 uh, with our technology. Um, and, uh, and our first, you know, few thousand locations were all McDonald's, um, um, uh, McDonald's restaurants. Um, and it made a lot of sense for these restaurants because you know, renting, renting a movie, uh, renting and returning a movie was a, you know, two-step transaction. So you would come to a retail location twice. You had to do that right. uh, to, to, to be part of that sale, right? So, so that was great for getting that customer, you know, to that retail location, thereby, thereby selling them something else. You know, they smell the fries, they, you know, see something else and they, they go and transact there. And, you know, many other retail location, retail concepts use this, you know, it was like sort of like back in the day, like photo processing at Walgreens and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and even the, the way a lot of these retail stores are designed today, you know, uh, involve basically cold marketing, other things to, to the customer that comes in. So that was, that was McDonald's interest in the, in the whole deal. And then basically much later on, 
um, uh, a company called Coinstar, which uh, oh, yeah. had a lot of these retail locations in grocery stores, came along as a strategic investor, and then they ended up uh, ultimately acquiring the entire company. Um, so that's, but but the timing of that was really interesting because it was timing was interesting because that was a time when uh, that was a time in between when Blockbuster reached like mm. a certain peak, and mm -hmm. then. Uh, but there was also a gap between when Blockbuster reached its peak and ne uh, Netflix really rolled out with streaming, mm -hmm. you know, and there were many years in, in that gap uh, where when streaming really started taking off in Netflix and, and basically, and this happens in many industries, you, you have, you have, you have one service here, but you have maybe a much more efficient service here, uh, but but you need something in between the two um, to uh, to bridge the gap, and and Redbox did a great job of it, and and it's still it's still around. You, you know, it was a more efficient way of delivering product to to retail, delivering that product to retail customers um, nationally. I mean, it's it's around in small small part of its former self, very small part of its former self, and I don't know how much longer it will be around. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, I mean, even I'm surprised it's around in 2022, <laughs> no, but, it, but it's there. Um, so it's interesting, sort of those bookends of, of I guess, Redbox are really interesting to me. So it's, if you could just tell us a little bit about that, like working with a huge company. I mean, here you are, you know, sort of this startup. How did you do that? Like, how did you even get into McDonald's, like literally? And how did you get them to sort of embrace, you know, what it is you were doing? And, uh, and then I have a follow up to that. Yeah, so I, the, the great thing at McDonald's and, and a lot of big companies do this and they, they design this on, on purposes. They have, um, uh, they had a, a ventures unit, a corporate ventures unit. Hmm. So that ran all their non-core businesses, you know, their non-core businesses. You know, they, they tried a couple of um, food concepts, uh, maybe the most notable of which was Chipotle. You know, oh, yeah, right. that, that was the same division that invested in Chipotle hmm. when it was, I think, four or five or, you know, some small number of restaurants to where it's to where it is now. And they spun that out, you know. Uh, it was the same group that did that investment to the to the group that sort of managed it. So basically, I mean, I think a lot of the big companies always realize that they need that separate corporate innovation arm uh, to make innovation like that work. So, and that's why it worked, you know. So in a way, we worked with the big company, but we didn't. We did not work with the big company because we we worked with it in very you know certain touch points. Uh, and that's, I think that's the only way it really works, you know, because innovation is always very hard at very large companies. Um, and that's, that, that's something everyone um, faces now. So I think for these companies to really transform, you know, you, that's why they create these, uh, these different innovation units. Yeah. Um, and then, and then the other bookend, if you will, and uh, I think it's a great way of describing it. You were sort of this bridge, if you will, between two, sort of a dying technology and an emerging technology. Um, did you guys ever think about getting into uh, streaming and, and all of that? Um, and if so, um, what, what, what happened? Yeah, you know, it, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, the, um, you know, we very much thought about becoming, um, you know, being in streaming, but I think by that time we were already acquired by a company in a completely different business, which is, mm. which is you know, so it was, uh, by the time the investments, you know, and, and, and streaming was not about just retail real estate anymore. You know, it was just right. about online customer acquisition, but more importantly, it was also a lot about, um, it was about, uh, you know, content and, and these other things. So the, the paradigm shifted dramatically. Uh, and, and we knew the paradigm was, was shifting. And, and basically, um, by that time, our acquirer or the company that made like multiple investments, right? Um, I mean, early on, it was pretty clear, like, that's not what they wanted to do. Um, right. It came from a different place. 
um, they were interested in, in placing a bet on something that was closer to their business, which is basically rolling out automated concepts in retail. And they wanted to stick with that. So, you know, I think that's, I think that's another lesson in innovation in startups too, is like, as a startup becomes big, if you don't take the steps, right. You, uh, you have, you are, you know, hamstrung by some of the same things that hamstrung the incumbents in, in the area that you disrupted in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. No, I hear you. That's very cool. I am. Um, so kind of fast forwarding a little bit. Um, so you exit from Redbox, and, um, you know, we know you're the founder of Halo Investing. And I, I, I'm just curious, like, how, how did you transition from Redbox? And um, what was sort of the, you know, I guess the inspiration, if you will, uh, for Halo? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and actually for that, too, there was sort of a company in between. So oh. between, between uh, after Redbox, you know, I always like trading options on my own. And, and I wanted to, wanted to uh, sort of go back to that. So I, I started a company for, and, and, you know, trading options and derivatives was very second nature to me, just because I'd done that a lot. And, and uh, just like sort of like playing poker is second nature, some people, right? So it's, it's, it was the same sort of thing. It was like a hobby that you wanted to make more than a hobby. And, right. and, and uh, so so I thought, hey, this would be pretty cool to build tools to make that, uh, make that available to everybody, you know, and and I learned a very interesting lesson from that. And you know, options are options are complicated, mm -hmm. um, and and I always thought you can make these complicated things simpler for everybody, you know. And and what I and I started a company called Trading Block, which is basically which was built to do that. And, and what was interesting that I learned from that is that most people don't want to learn complicated things. You know? <laughs> they don't want, it's sort of like, uh, you know, we made the analogy about, um, about uh, the early programmers who, you know, learned at the age of 12, right? And yeah. if you remember the first, the first computers were all these kit computers that you had to be, you had to be a geek, you had to be a hobbyist to sort of put together. And what I realized in trading options were people wanted, I wanted, a lot of people wanted the benefits of trading options. Uh, they wanted the benefits. I was okay with the complexity of it. I was, I was okay being the options geek, you know, mm -hmm. moving all the different parts and taking it apart and putting it back together. Most people were not, and most people don't want to, you know, it's so sort of like with computers too the the early adopters were the geeks the hobbies who took these things apart but when it really became more mainstream it was something that was in a box and nobody most people who use that box 99 percent of people who use that box didn't really know what was inside the box sure they just yeah. wanted the benefits of the box and that's sort of how i transitioned to halo is because you know one thing options do give you is they give you contractual protection in your portfolio like you basically have Somebody with a very large balance sheet saying, okay, I, I'll, I'll give you this protection on the downside of, of your portfolio or, or some, you know, cap your upside in certain ways to give you other benefits. And, and, and you can create that with options, but most people didn't want to know how to put that together and take it apart. It was just too complicated. It was too technical for them. Uh, but people still wanted the benefit of it. So mm -hmm. that's... So that's the same thing uh, when, you know, came, uh, came into Halo, we found a way to sort of do that for portfolios, but give it in one package product without getting into all the, the nitty gritty of, you know, how it's made and what's in it and all that stuff. So that's sort of how Halo started. We, you know, we, we create these products called, we, we trade these products called structured products, which we basically deliver into, into retail customer portfolios. Got it. And so, I mean, that, that sort of transition from, uh, let's say, a not so user friendly kind of platform to a user friendly platform. Uh, tell us about that. And, and by the way, um, I'd love to hear more about your team and, and starting all of this and kind of what, 
what early, early on with Halo, like what role were you playing and what roles were your other sort of core team? What were they doing? Absolutely. So um, the history of these products called Structured Notes, where they were, you know, it's, it's about a $3 trillion marketplace globally. You know, that's, that's what it currently is. Uh, and, it, and it was this big even when we started Halo, which was only six or seven years ago. And, uh, uh, but this was sold by very big investment banks to very rich investors at private banks throughout the world. Yep. Um, it was sold in this very high touch way where people were, you know, on the phone and sending emails and, you know, very manual process, inefficient and manual. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our goal, me and my co-founder, we wanted to sort of bring that down to the masses, sort of, you know, have everybody, we want to take it from the very rich people to bring it more and more retail, more and more downstream, where, uh, you know, anybody, any, somebody who's a school teacher or a bus driver or a firefighter could have access to that protection, that portfolio, because we felt that wasn't right that everybody could benefit off this, but these products were so clunky in how they were constructed and distributed that people, you know, you need, you needed to have a minimum size of a million or $3 million to get into the product. Um, so we, we made it uh, much small sizes where you could do it at a thousand dollars and, and, you know, buy it right off a platform and, you know, technology brought a lot of those benefits. Uh, and we wanted to keep reducing the, the cost considerably of, of doing that. So, and the start, initial startup team uh, beyond me and my co-founder was largely uh, a technology team. We were always tech first, uh, mm. tech forward, mm -hmm. you know, and in, in finance, because this was a product that was only done on Wall Street, only done in New York. Um, and, and we also felt like the center of gravity would just, move beyond wall street right and so it was basically a com combination of finance and technology uh which and that that technology could take some of the things uh that only existed at big banks big banks are our partners but we've taken and democratized both the manufacturing of the product but also the distribution of the product from from beyond those banks uh, and that's what we did so the first team was all technology but then uh, after we built out the product and we started having some initial success with it, then we, then we started building out more of a sales and operations team. And now we're about 200 people in, wow. in about four different countries. Wow. So early on, that's really interesting. So early on, how did you, without a sales force or what have you, how did you get those earliest of early adopters? So the, the uh, early on, the, the product was so compelling, you know, I've, I've always, you know, I think different people have different skill sets that they bring to the game. Um, my, you know, my skill set uh, was much more on, on the product side. So, you know, using, using technology, the product was so compelling. The product was so easy to use uh, hmm. that for, you know, the people we sell to are advisors who manage money for investors. And these advisors um, had an amazing user experience with the product. And, you know, the key to any industry, any business is that if you improve the user experience for your customer, you win over that customer. Like you don't, you know, uh, very often people, I think, fail with startups just because they oversolve different parts of the problem. And the user experience always sounds like, um, like too simple an issue to solve, but you know, we solved that really well. Uh, and when we keep solving it really well, that, you know, it just changed how people consume the product and people really love, people really loved our platform and started buying more and more of it. And then, then we had, then we got a sales force to start selling into many of these advisors because the sales force really, you know, increased, uh, uh, increase, you know, how uh, increase how many people interact with it, you know, because, it, you know, you have to do different things with marketing and sales to, to really scale up your business. But initially it was very product driven and that worked out really well for us. Um, so interesting. I mean, you be, before Halo, I mean, certainly you were successful with Redbox 
And uh, although you didn't mention the, the sort of the in-between startup. Yeah, it was called Trading Block, yeah. Trading Block. Um, did that, did you end up selling that or what ended up happening with Trading Block? Yeah, I ended up selling it. It was not a, it was not a big sale, but it was, oh. you know, ended up selling it. It was, it was very, very much of a niche company, you know, to, to cater to just active retail option traders. So, so I'm curious and I, I'd love to have you walk us through this. So you fairly recently, uh, raised quite a bit of money and I'm, I'm curious you know, I'm sure there are a lot of folks on with us tonight, um, me included, uh, that work in the early sort of startup stage. And, um, you know, raising $100 million isn't, isn't something that one does every day. So tell us about that experience. Like where um, did you, did you uh, raise capital before that? And then how did that lead to the much larger raise? Um, and eventually I'd love to get to what's sort of the big vision. Yeah. And, and maybe, maybe I'll start off with the big vision, you know, because okay. I think that's sort of what leads to these raises. So, so at the end of the day, what we really want to do, what we fundamentally believe is that, you know, the average investor, you know, we have, we have a view that that's maybe, um, maybe, uh, uh, I, I mean, not, not the most um, common view maybe today on Wall Street uh, or in the investing world, especially when you see things like Robinhood and when you see these active mm-hmm. trading platforms. Um, and, and we have the view that, hey, the average person should not be a trader. Like right. if, if you are a professional trader, you should be a trader. But if you're not a professional trader and you have other things to do, you're, you're a school teacher, you're a doctor, a lawyer. At that point, when you're trading, you know, it's hobby, it's a hobby, it's fun, but it's not a way to manage your retirement, right? The average person, I mean, you can do that as a hobby and you can do it as a hobby, just like you can do that for fun. Just like when you go to Vegas, you're not a professional poker player, but you may play poker, right? And you can play poker for fun, but um, you shouldn't do that, you know, it's like, you either are a professional trader or, uh, or a semi-professional trader, or you're not a trader. Right. And if you're not a trader, um, you know, you should just have, you should just use simple math, simple compounding uh, to, to get your retirement investment goals. And that simple compounding, it's not just from, you know, investing in fixed income, but it's also investing. You can be in the stock market, but, you know, if you have the right, structures where you have the protection on the downside so you don't have to worry about how much the market went up or how much the market went down today or you reduce from a lot of those those swings in the market um but you're still exposed you still get the the growth rate in the market without a lot of the 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 volatility that you get with that growth um that's what we built this uh that's what we built this product for that's where we think every investor in America and every investor in the world, every retail investor, every non-professional investor should be in, you know? Um, and that's, but 99.9% of, of equity money is not like that today. Mm-hmm. Um, even though, you know, even though there's $3 trillion of structured notes today in the world, it's, that's mostly very rich people. Right, rich right. people do it this way. You know, we think everybody should do it this way. Everybody should at least put, you know, at least a good portion of their of their portfolio towards it. So that's the goal we want to build towards. So we have this incredible market to to go convert, right? Uh, and we're still in so early innings in the in this game, and uh, and so given that that market, you know, we just felt it would take some capital to to get there. And, and the capital you raise is, you know, a function of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the product you've built and the success you have to date, but also uh, the ability for you to, to connect and communicate with investors about your ability to fulfill that goal in the future, right? So um, we're not, we didn't do this to just sort of sell the company and leave. We did this to sort of build that uh, to the future. And, and, and we, the other thing me and my, uh, me and my co-founder did and with, with everybody on the team is that 
we went and got investors mm-hmm. who were very strategic and could really help us to to get there. That's that's the other big thing, you know. And I think, and, and I think the good thing is we've had we've had a great equity market, we've had a great venture market in the last couple of years, and and everybody sort of looking at this bigger innovation capital, this bigger scope for what they can build. Um, but these, you know, financial cycles sort of go up and down, but, you know, innovation is, is much more of a longer term, has a longer term time frame than just, you know, the very short term dips in financial markets. So that's sort of what we believe. So we want to, we, we, we raise this money. We, we're having incredible momentum and progress, but there's just a lot more for us to, to build out there. Yeah. I mean, the size, I guess the potential market is almost unimaginable what you can go after. Um, in a moment here, I'm gonna open it up to questions uh, in the audience, but I, I, wonder, I wonder just kind of thinking back um, and you've had a number of experiences uh, along the way, going from very small now to pretty big. Um, is there any sort of, from your experience, any sort of, uh, I don't know, common threads of, of things you've done right and maybe things you've done wrong along the way. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I would say, right, um, I'd say a couple of things, like, you know, very oversimplifying it, but to, uh, I think there are like three ingredients to, to a startup, right? One is you have to broadly understand, you know, how the product works broadly understand you don't have to you know you don't um you you don't have to uh be the expert expert at it the the second thing is you have to understand how money works you have to know how to raise capital you have to know how to manage sales you know you have to know how to manage finances and the third thing is you have to know how to attract inspire uh and lead uh, teams, you have to organize large teams of people to execute what you're, uh, what you're trying to do. Uh, I think in, I, I think that those are like the three great, three main components, right? But the, the, the biggest, the biggest mistake I've always made at every startup, you know, and, and I keep making this again and again is like <laughs> my first iteration of every startup is I'm always all over solving a problem. You know, oh. I think, and I, I, I I think I'm making it simple enough, but when I actually go to market, I didn't need to do 80% of what I needed to do, or what I did, you know? And, <laughs> and, and I've learned, I mean, I still make that mistake every time, but I've learned uh, to at least recognize it and then react to it. You know, I think that's most important. It's more important that you react to your mistakes than that you not make mistakes because we all make mistakes. It's just, it's, right. it's not whether you don't make mistakes that'll, uh, spell success is sort of what you do once you make the mistake. That's right. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen just from my experience that I've worked with hundreds of startups. And I don't know if this is a less eloquent way of describing what you just said, but it's kind of uh, focus, you know, coming down to focus where, and believe me, and I'm sure like you, it, it's that over solving. Well, if we can do this, well, we can do this. And if we can do this, then we can do this. Um, whereas, you know, actually solving that problem might take a much more narrow kind of, uh, solution. Um, so I think, um, I'm going to, again, going to try to open it up here to questions from the crowd and please anyone, uh, feel free to put something into the chat. Um, I know we talked a little bit earlier about, if you mentioned at McDonald's, you know, they had this kind of venture group. Um, have you contemplated doing anything like that within Halo or even, I don't know, outside of Halo? Like sort of- uh, You mean, create, into- sorry, creating a venture group or, or investing, just, just being an investor, like a venture investor? I would say either or both, where, you know, maybe is there, uh, if you were to prognosticate, you know, down the road, could you see Halo like creating that kind of uh, early stage environment? that you sort of took advantage of at McDonald's or, um, but also too, I would love to hear, you know, are you an investor and what do you look for in, in early stage startups? Yeah. So, 
Um, you know, so two things. One is uh, Halo itself, like we already look to do that. We, we look to invest in other stuff, but for us, we're not as much of a financial investor in, in anything. We are more, I mean, we invest money, but we look to invest only for something that strategically helps Halo. So okay. it's a different, you know, we, that will be sometimes acqui hires for acquisitions, or it'd be, it'll be something from a technology and other standpoint that helps, helps the company um, technology or some other business standpoint that actually helps the company. So we do that. We are very, very strategic about what we do. Um, so, so we're different than maybe the typical, uh, venture investor, uh, sure. in, in that regard and, and about me investing too, right. I've, I've done some, I've done some of it, but I also, you know, at the end of the day, I am, I'm less interested in maybe some of the financial returns of these investments. And I just sort of look at myself and I know, I know I'm self-aware to know that I, I really like being more of an operator than, uh, than an investor. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I, um, you know, I think that's sort of what I can contribute to the world is to, is to be an operator. So, so when I look at these different things at some point, uh, even after Halo, I want to be, you know, on the operational side of something. Uh, more than as an investor. So that's very, very interesting. And I was going to ask you, and you, you said it yourself. So after Halo, whenever that is, uh, whether that's you know two years from now, twenty years from now, what what does that look like for you? Yeah, no, I know. I um, after Halo, I'd love to maybe take uh, take a month off, and then <laughs> uh, and then uh, go. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to do something else that, you know, maybe going back into, um, yeah, into hard tech, you know, which is uh, something that's a little bit more physical uh, with technology, you know, like Redbox was something like that. Yeah. Um, and not in just pure finance itself. Um, but, you know, there, there are a bunch of ideas I, I doodle on even now. Uh, that would be something I want to do. But, you know, you can only run one thing uh, at a time, at least for now. Uh, but I've, there are a bunch of ideas I have right now, you know, and I'm just interested in things that change the world in some way. It's cliche as that, that may sound, right? It's, but there are, I think, a lot of problems um, that sometimes the, the, some parts of the technology exists, some parts of the commercialization exists, but people haven't done enough of it to really make it uh, uh, more of a, more of a mass, you know, more of a, uh, bigger solution. I mean, you see that, you see that, yeah, you see that in healthcare. You know, a lot of healthcare, uh, op huge opportunities for for people to innovate in healthcare. Huge opportunities in climate change. You know, huge opportunities in in uh, in uh, poverty reduction. You know, many different things out there um, that I think would be so cool to work on. Totally agree. Totally agree. So as we wrap up here, I, uh, um, I know you, you talked a little bit about uh, sort of over solving uh, number, you know, along the way in every one of your startups. But um, thinking back, if you could isolate something that you might describe as as your biggest fuck up, excuse my French, what what would that be? Uh, I mean, you know, there's so many to choose from, right? So, uh, <laughs> so uh, that's I think that's uh, that's a hard that's a hard part of it. But I'll tell you, even at Halo. So even at Halo, when we first launched, right? We uh, we uh, again, uh, you know, a good example is like we create a product that was too complex, like way too complex, and and. Uh, we uh, we raised some money. We you know we it was it was sort of like these structured returns using options and this complicated strategy, complicated housing distributed, and uh, we did it. And it was just incredibly hard to to distribute, you know. Yeah. Uh, and we had to completely pivot and change, like six months after we we um, we launched, and it was a big internal discussion. So, uh, so, I mean, it was, a you know, and it, that was in, in our decks all the way until, you know, while we raised capital, 
we we launched and then we had to go and tell all our investors this is why we did this and this is why we changed and we think it's the right thing to do and 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 that was a that was a very hard time you know it was a very uh, it was a little scary you know because we didn't know which way that would go uh, but it worked out really well for us but you know it's one of those things from your biggest fuck ups as you say yeah. uh, come sometimes your biggest successes because I think mm. it's, it's okay to it's okay to make mistakes and I like um you know i think like i said it's we all make a lot of mistakes but but it's most most it's most important to just be honest about what uh whether it's working or not you know yeah you can that that's what i think a lot of people that's 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 where most people really make the mistake the mistake is not the original mistake the mistake is sticking with the original mistake that's right <laughs> <laughs> i love the quote what was it your biggest fuck up can become your greatest success or something like that. That's a, I'm going to, that's a keeper. I'm going to keep that one. Um, there is one other question here. I just want to throw at you from the crowd. Um, actually a couple here. So uh, let me try to translate this. So you, you often hear that expression, do things that don't scale um, as uh, I'll just say early stage startup. Do you recommend building infrastructure early? Yeah, so it's, um, I would say it, it really depends, right? It depends on how much, it depends on how much uh, gas in the tank you have and all that. But very often, most of us don't have that much capital when you're doing these things. Uh, so I would say build, I always build the minimum infrastructure to make, to just prototype, improve. You know, I'm, I'm more interested in, in creating the basic product that can sell to validate that the, that the market exists or people want a product like that. I'm much more interested in validating customer demand than in validating whether I've built a perfect version of a product. You know, sure. and there are many ways with prototypes to validate customer demand. So, and prototypes don't require, prototypes by definition don't require a lot of infrastructure. Got you know, it. prototypes are about something different than just core infrastructure. So, so I think the short answer is no. It's great. I, great advice. I, I actually would agree with that. Uh, question here about Robinhood. I think you sort of hinted at this earlier, but what differentiates Halo from Robinhood? And what would uh, drive someone uh, from Robinhood to you guys? Yeah, so you know, I think that's really interesting. I think I think Robinhood's built a good company in certain regards, right? But I I don't understand. I don't agree with their fundamental philosophy in what they're trying to make retail investors, right? In that uh, they're making retail investors into active. They're trying to make retail investors into active traders, and that doesn't statistically like it's almost a law of physics. You can see it doesn't work. Right. Uh, and you see these in any active trading account and any brokerage firm, but the more you gamify mm. uh, investing, if you gamify investing, what you create is a game. You don't really create something that's for your retirement and, and savings. And uh, so it's a great, it's a great gaming platform, but it's not, it should not be, um, you know, understood as something that's for your long-term uh, uh, long-term retirement or investment goals, you know, and that's, and statistically that's always proven to be the case. And the more active, the more active these investors are with, with the accounts, mm -hmm. uh, the smaller their accounts become. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's also statistically shown. I mean, if you, I mean, there are exceptions to the rule, but the exceptions to the rule, the consistent exceptions to the rule are when, uh, and if you see, consistent exceptions of the rule, those are your professional traders at Robin. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, so one more question from me. I'm just curious. Um, and I know in my, in my world, there's been a lot of dollars going into biotech and what we call spec pharma. And a lot of that came from people sitting around their houses during the pandemic, looking for stuff to do and invest in and so on. Um, how has the pandemic kind of treated your business and has there been any impact as it seems like it's waning here uh recently I, i'm just curious yeah so 
the pandemic in, in certain ways, uh, I mean, in certain ways has been good for our business, but I think in certain ways, the pandemic has been good for innovation. Okay, sure. because the pandemic has accelerated innovation and we didn't know what the pandemic would do due to our business in, in early 2020 and even the middle of 2020. You know, we didn't really know because the market could have gone so many different directions um, um, back then. And, uh, but, you know, the, the interesting thing, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you a little, little story, like the way we build the products, uh, like I said, these products are mostly sold to very rich people. And when you sell products to very rich people, you usually go and meet them and you meet their advisors, you wine and dine their advisors, you take them to ball games. And, you know, it's a very high touch sales process. That's how these products were all traditionally sold. Mm-hmm. We have a very tech forward in how we, uh, how we sort of built around the sales process that we did the most uncharacteristic thing in, in selling these products, which we never, we would never go and meet our, we'd never go and meet our customers. We would only, we'd, we'd talk to them on the phone and we'd give them the value of the platform, but we'd never go and meet our customers. Um, and that was all the way until 2020. Guess hmm. what? After 2020, right? Like we didn't know, we didn't, you know, we didn't know the world would, turn out to be this way but right. like um, a, a business where you didn't have to go meet your customer just just scaled up a lot faster uh, and uh, and and so the future came a little bit faster you know that wow. way uh, for for our business and we didn't know that was going to happen but it but it happened so that was that was really interesting for us very cool all right well we are at I think the top of the hour and uh, this has been an incredible, incredible night and incredible conversation. We appreciate uh, you sharing your story and lessons learned along the way. Uh, I'm gonna ask everybody to unmute for a moment, please unmute. And if we could one more time, give it up for Bijou. Thank you, Bijou. Thank you, Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, really, really wonderful. Uh, Thanks very much. And uh, thanks everyone for coming out here tonight. Uh, Hopefully you make it home safely or stay warm. All right, everyone, have a good night. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Wonderful discussion. And I will thank Mark.